Hey folks, Big Swag here to tell you why bad boy mowers are better. Bad boys are the toughest mower out there. Maintenance is quick and easy with our exclusive swing away design. Nobody else has it. Plus they got easy ride suspension, smooth like a cat bike. And the lowest prices, 26 horsepower, 60 inch cut, $49.95. That's why bad boys are better. Of course, I had to monsterize mine. Bad boy mower, mow with an attitude. We have got Brett Wagner on the show, uh, otherwise known as the Big Schwag. He is a phenomenal uh, influence in the entertainment industry, and you're over in in the U.S. at the moment, in uh, in Los Angeles. I am in Los Angeles, yeah, California. And would I like to move? Yes, <laughs> would you? Anywhere, uh, you know, California <laughs> yeah. for the folks that don't know that maybe, especially overseas like yourself or anybody else around the the globe, California is it's got rough politics out here, and it's uh, our our state has gone from one of the gems of the United States. You would think of uh, Florida and California were two of the most beautiful places, and it's such a tough tough place to live now with taxes and. All this yeah. other uh, shiznit that's going on that I'm ready to move. But uh, this is where the business is. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, if you're going to be an entertainer, I'm kind of stuck. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would, I was, yeah, I, I, I hear everything you're saying. I would, having said that, love a, uh, an opportunity myself to live over in Los Angeles. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe one day, who knows? I'm loving your shirt, by the way, Brett. Loving it. Very nice. Thank you, buddy. This yeah, is a yeah. company I do a little spokes stuff for it's called dixon they 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 do flannels okay. they are the flannel kings but they also do some of these uh they call them like party boy shirts they're uh uh and they fit me for being a large guy they have a 5x that fits me so well that i always got to get a couple because they're nice you know i'm usually I, I play a lot of bikers and bad guys on tv so i always have the cut off you know, sleeves, and that's how I walk around normally. And yeah. the wife gets a little angry, so uh, <laughs> I always try to have a couple of these in the car just so I can throw on to look presentable. Right, right, right. Good stuff. All right. Well, let's um for for anyone who doesn't know who Brett is, um, he's had over one hundred TV and film credits uh, in the U.S. Sons of Anarchy, NCIS, Los Angeles, Hannah Montana, Leatherface in the two thousand and three remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He is the voice of uh, Monster Garage. Uh, and you've just come back to that recently after a 14-year break. Yeah, so we, I, so let's say 20 years ago, we started the show on Discovery yeah. and it was a big hit. And I just did the, I, I came from the world of professional wrestling. I mean, I was an actor, but I was doing some pro wrestling. And I did a documentary called uh, Wrestling School for Discovery Channel. And that producer, Tom Beers, he's a very famous producer. He's done Deadliest Catch, Ice Road Truckers, Storage Wars. And I always stayed friends with him because I knew one of these days, you know, I always wanted to be a host. Yeah. Because if you're going to do entertainment, you want to do everything, right? Yeah. If you're a real good actor, eventually you may slow down on the acting. So if you can do radio, if you can do interviews, you should do it all. And I just stayed this guy's friend because I thought that something would happen. You know, um, something could come about it. And he was a very smart guy. And he came to me one day and said, um, hey, Brett, can you do your wrestling voice for this TV show I'm doing? And so I would do the intro a little tease in the middle, and then I would do the challenge at the end of the show. And Tom Beers, he would do the rest of the narration. So we did 89 episodes over five years. It was a very big hit. In fact, the UK did their own version of Monster Garage. Yeah, yeah. I think for a year had their own host. And um, it was awesome. I got a lot of publicity from it. And, of course, I worked it. I used my wrestling name, The Big Swag. Well, this is The Big Swag around Monster Garage. And I did that whole thing. And I used to start making appearances at a lot of drag racing shows, obviously bike events. And um, for four, it was done, right? Jesse yeah, yeah. James, our host, he was tired of doing the show. Uh, Discovery, I think, was tired of it, doing it. And so for 14 years, we had a layoff. 
I continued doing my acting and do I hosted a drag racing show in between not a RuPaul drag racing, but a car's going down the track. Uh, yeah, just clear that one up. <laughs> and nothing with RuPaul. She's done very well. Um, but then we started talking a couple of years ago. They said they wanted to bring it back. And um, when you've had a 14 year layoff of yelling and screaming on the microphone, it was, uh, I was a little nervous to be honest with you, because my voice is not what it used to be at, at 53 years old. Um, uh, four, 14 years ago, it was a little easier to yell and scream. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, and now coming back into it, um, and, and I do the only narration. Uh, there's no more Tom Beers doing his thing. I have to do the whole thing. So I had to separate, still be the big swag, but you can't be way up here at a 10. You can be at a 10, but then you got to bring it back down to a four, Yeah. you yeah. know, to explain stuff and do some common narration on the show. And so it uh, it took me a couple of shows to get, you know, get into it and get with yeah. it, and Are you feeling a lot of tea, a lot of honey. Yeah, exactly. And, tea uh, and honey. <laughs> trying to save the, uh, trying to learn about my voice a little bit more, and and I'm not a professional voice guy. I mean, I'm starting to try to make a living at it and audition and everything. Um, but it's um, there's a lot of tricks to the trade on saving yeah. your voice. And I coming from the world of professional wrestling and doing the initial Monster Garage, I was just I'm a yeller. I yeah. scream and yell and my voice was great for it. It could do it. And now it just, and yeah. you need to finesse it now. So what, so what have you done then other than tea and honey? What, uh, what tricks have you sort of taken on? What, what, what warm ups preparation are you doing to well, keep it, to keep your voice it, strong? And yeah. Yeah. So I'm learning. So we, you and I are, uh, how we met is we're on a, a, a voice page on Facebook. If folks yeah. don't know, there's pages like that. And that's how I met you. And that's how we've connected. But I put a little, uh, I said, hey, listen, I'm coming back into this after 14 years. I, I yell and scream a lot. I need to know how to save my voice. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of these people are, are working voiceover actors. And so I've gotten a lot of good tips and I, yet I have not started them, but there's a lot of good stuff I need to do, uh, you know, vocal warm ups, um, which I'm starting to learn how to do. And I'm still reading a lot on it, but um I will tell you the night before I have to go do a, an episode of Monster Garage. It's it's a very quiet night. I'm not talking a lot. I'm just saving my voice and and I do do a little warm up. Uh, not that it's singing. It's just some. I, I I talk a little bit before we get in there and I and I kind of warm up the voice a little bit. But uh, there's a lot of different things I don't know about that you probably do that uh, I am still in the process of. Uh, writing down my notes yeah, sure. to get going. So, Wow. Um, is, is it, uh, do you, st do you enjoy it in a similar way to, to how you did 14 years ago? Do you get a similar buzz from it, a similar kick or is it, is it different now? You've obviously had, a, you know, many more experiences over, over the 14 year period. Yeah. How, how was that for you? Well, it was very nervous at first because now I am the only voice and narration on the show. And Tom Beers, our executive producer was so good at it. And he's, um, He's been the voice on so many different shows and he's an expert at it and knows how to, you know, how to, how to do it more properly than I, I'm more of like a loose cannon. I'm more of a professional wrestler. Cause like my voice and how I, you know, scream and yell came from the world of professional wrestling. So, um, it's different. So I was a little nervous. And so, when, in fact, and it's honest, you know, Dis discovery channel didn't know if they really wanted me to do it. So, honestly uh, we did eight new episodes and i said look i'll do the first episode if you like it great you can pay me just give me a contract if you don't then it was a freebie and yeah. there we go yeah so we did it they liked it um it's it's different now i i love it i'm in there for about two hours before i could get in and out in 20 minutes and what i used to do you know we have it's a script i would do it their way then I would swag it up a little bit, do it my way, and they could pick what they wanted. Yeah. Now it's uh, it'll take me about to do an hour show. It takes me about two and a half hours. Yeah. yeah. You got to have a couple breaks in between. I will have a couple breaks. I I will do about two or three hot teas. Yeah. And even if there's no honey, it's just the hot tea and the hot water and and uh, nice. but it's fun. It, it, it takes a lot out of you. You know, people go, "Well, you're just talking." I'm like. No, I, you I, go I, talk. 
I can vouch for, I mean, yeah. I'm not doing, not doing what you're doing by any stretch of the ad- imagination, but uh, definitely voiceover presenting, um, you know, if you're ha- having to use your voice a lot, theater, I do a fair bit of theater uh, or, or did do pre, uh, pre-corona. Um, it really does, you know, you could be in a show for three months, four months, five months, and you have to really look after your voice and, you know, drink all the tea and honey that you, <laughs> that you mentioned. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I can totally imagine it must be exhausting, but uh, can, you mentioned the, the, your name, your wrestling name, uh, the big swag. Folks, for all our Facebook fans of American Muscle, August 16th, American Muscle Mustang Show, it's going down. Where are we, Justin? We are at Maple Grove Race, where you guys do not want to miss this one. The swag is here himself. Justin Dugan, the face of American Muscle, the man putting it down. Six years you guys been having this car show, and it's going down right here, and I'm so excited. And oh yeah, we are giving that thing away. Built for the famous. A SEMA show in Las Vegas. Almost 700 horse. And if folks want to win that, what do they got to do? They got to go to AmericanMuscle.com slash MMD. You have one entry per week. I can't win it, so you better win it. And if you do not go and go on the website and try to win it, I swear I'll come to your house. I'll eat all your food and he'll steal your women. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That was amazing what was the inspiration behind that name how did it come about what does it mean does it have any sort of was it just a sound that you liked or yeah <laughs> it was yeah so i used to be a, a bouncer and you know security guy and bodyguard for a lot of bands over the years and my last name's wagner yeah and uh, i used to work the door with this guy australian guy uh australian tom and we worked a very big famous kind of club in hollywood called smalls which was a uh, one of those places they didn't have an address, didn't have a name. Yet all the celebrities would be there on the weekend. And he used to call me Schwagner. Okay. So at 30 years old, I kind of had a midlife crisis. I was, you know, trying to be an actor. I was working the bars at night, every single night, seven days a week, auditioning during the day. And then I had like this midlife crisis at 30. And I said, well, I always try to do things. I always try to try stuff. So it doesn't matter whether it's radio uh, doing podcasts, uh, you know, acting. Mm. I, I decided I wanted to get into the world of professional wrestling, but I just said, well, we'll call myself the big swag. Mm. And I did that for five, six years and, you know, got to work with guys like John Cena, who's obviously doing very well for himself in the, in the wrestling and, and now in, in the acting world. Um, and so when we came about to do monster garage, uh, I, I knew I wanted, I had to brand myself because if you, you could just be this voice and no one ever gives you credit, you're the voice of that show. That's great. But I said, can I, can I say, Hey, this is the big swag, you know, and we're in Long Beach, California. And Tom Beers was like, okay, we can do that. I don't know, uh, you know, if discovery channel is going to like it, but discovery channel didn't mess with it. Our show was such a big hit at first mm. that they never asked. And to be honest with you, I think swag means like low grade, uh, weed <laughs> okay. that's 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 the terminology for it so it. uh one five years into doing monster garage one of the guys uh came out from discovery <laughs> channel and he goes hey listen you know your 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 nickname means like low grade weed and i was like yeah but it's too late to change it now right we yeah, can't yeah. change it now i've been doing it for five years regardless so. of what it means uh, forget that yeah it sounds, so. it sounds great <laughs> you said you, you you like to try different things you like to challenge yourself in different yep. areas but what was the actual sort of call or the driving to get you into wrestling in, in the first place did you did you know other oh. people did you um do you have friends that were in the industry before family members that perhaps yeah what, what sort of pulled you into that world yeah so what got me into wrestling was um being an actor I, and I always, as a kid, I watched professional wrestling all the time. So mm. I even knew a lot of the UK, I would follow the UK wrestlers, big daddy and some other guys from over there that were famous wrestlers in the, in, in the UK. And of course, in the United States, the dusty Rose, the Ric flares and all this, but I had a friend named Rick Drazen who was a older, older professional wrestler. And I said, I really want to try this sometime. And he says, why don't you come and, be my manager, you know? And so I kind of broke into the business that way, being his manager. And um, I real quick within the first year of trying to be a professional wrestler, I realized, well, this is just, I'm just too out of shape, but 
I could talk really well. So I, I stuck with five years being like this heel manager, you know, the big swag had the swag army. All my guys were bad guys and I could always talk. So I also ran a, a promo class as we talk about. If you watch professional wrestling, you see like the rock yeah. stone cold. These guys can cut promos. You don't need to practice it. They just are like that. It's improv, you know? And so what, I was that guy that could do by, that. What do you mean by cut promos for, I, I, okay, for so anyone that doesn't get the terminology? If, okay, yeah. So, you, well, if you watch wrestling, guys will come out and they get on the microphone. They have to cut a promo about who they're wrestling. You oh, know, I tonight see, it's Stone Cold. The big swag is going to be going up against Warren the Magnificent. <laughs> the guy's too pretty. Yeah. He's got perfect teeth. Yeah. He's got a nice hairline. <laughs> Not for long. So if you can't cut a promo, what they do in professional wrestling, if, if you're still a good worker, if you're a good wrestler, they like your look, they'll stick you with a manager like me. Now, I am trying to get heat, as we call it. I want the crowd to either boo me or cheer me as well. Yeah. So, but if you can't do that on your own, then you got to share the spotlight with me. Right. And I want to get my own heat. I want to, I want to work for the WWE. I want to be on TV. So I would teach guys and tell them either you learn to do this or you're going to get stuck with someone else. And that guy's going to be stealing half of your spotlight. So, yeah. So cutting promos is a big deal in the professional wrestling. I did it for five years. I loved it. Um, it made me a better actor, first of all, um, because I go into a room for an audition. I mean, we don't do that anymore now. Everything's Zoom or you stealth tape because of COVID. Yeah. But before when I went in a room and there'd be five people there, the, the director, the some of the clients and the, and the casting director, that's nothing. I just came from working 2,500 people, you know, in a, in a, in a stadium someplace and getting them to boo me or cheer me. So what is five people? Yeah. So it made me better in auditions. It made me better thinking on my feet, being very quick with improv. Yeah. Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't. You learn to, yeah, yeah. And I imagine it also, but your, it increases your sort of your persona as well and your, your, yeah, your charisma and you can just walk in a room and people are like, wow. 100%. You learn to talk about anything, right? Yeah. So, I could say, Warren, tell me about, and, and a lot of guys are nervous when they first start talking. And I said, say, tell me what you had for lunch or breakfast. Yeah. What does that have to do with anything? I said, because I want to hear what you had for lunch or breakfast. Now tell me what you had for lunch or breakfast, but be angry about it. Now be very, you know, gracious about it. Now forget the breakfast and put in that opponent you're wrestling. And it's, it's a simple deal, but yeah, some yeah. people are not good at talking. You're good at talking. I'm good at talking. A lot of people never get that. And when you're an actor or if you're doing voiceovers, you better be able to change on a dime like that. Cause you go into a room and the director says, that's great. But now can you do it this way? Mm -hmm. Some actors and, and some people are so set on what they practice the whole night before that they can't do that. Uh, yeah. You have to be able to switch it up. And when you're, achieve that when you get that clarity that i can do whatever they ask me to do i can change whatever they ask me to change you will be a better actor it'll be a lot easier for you and the professional wrestling really helped me with that and uh, now there's nothing i can't talk about i may not know anything about it but i can bs about it enough yeah. to make you go oh i can kill five or ten minutes with you yeah. you know whether i know about that subject or not I'm just thinking like someone like Dwayne Johnson would be a really good example of that as well. You know, going from being the rock, I mean, he was awesome as the rock and awesome as a wrestler, but his career since leaving wrestling has sort of just obviously blown up. And he's, I think he's right in the top five highest paid film actors in the world when it's, and he is actually really good as well. I think he's, he's a top actor, you know, you know, he's just, he, top notch. he's very good. Yeah. So that would be top a really notch. Good... So you got, you got two different guys. So you got the stone cold Steve Austin. Who is a great guy who has a persona? So, and I'm not knocking on Stone Cold, but he's kind of a, not a one trick pony, but he's that guy. Yeah. And then you take the rock who can be many people. He's great with the comedy. He's great with being just a badass. He's great at anything he does. In fact, uh, you know, you, the rock may be the next president of the United States <laughs> in a few years 
He's got that much popularity. And people are saying, hey, run for office. And he would get voted in. Uh, him and Kevin Hart are the two highest paid actors yes. in the United States. They make yeah. the most money in movies. And it's not a surprise that they do all these movies together as yeah, well. Right. I was gonna but say. yeah, The Rock is, um, he's an improv god is what it is. Because you don't need to, he doesn't need to know about something to talk about. And, and that's, that's the whole thing. If you can master that, where you can just BS about anything, then you have come full circle and it's going to help your acting. Mm. It's going to help your voiceover work because I'm not your normal voiceover guy. When I read for stuff, I can be the, I can read real nice and everything, but I always try to give them a take, a big swag take on the end. So they can go, Hey, and one of these times someone's going to go, Hey, that's it. Yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to be different. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm also trying, it's tough. It's a tough business, man. No, for sure. For sure. Um, I think uh, briefly, just going back to, to Dwayne Johnson, I think it's a likability factor as well. You know, he's got obviously has the talent and he works incredibly hard, but he, he comes across like an incredibly genuine person. In any interview that I've seen with him, he's he seems super likable. And I think that goes such a long way in in this particular industry. You know, you have to be likable. People have to want to work with you. And, you know, that's it's very important. One hundred percent. So. I'll tell you, when you go work for the WWF back then, when I was doing some work with them, I, I helped run a minor league system for them called Ultimate Pro Wrestling. And you would take guys to go do a dark match. I, you know, John Cena, we would go up to San Jose and John Cena would be the warm up before they start TV taping, before it was on TV. You got to go out there and warm up the crowd anyways, like a, a comedian would do warming up a, an audience for a TV show. Yeah. So we go out and do a dark match and then you sit inside all day or in the cafeteria area and you just, that's where you wait until they call you and say, come on, you're getting ready to go do your match. And Dwayne would be the only, one of the only guys that would come around. You see a couple new guys and he'd come over and stick his hand. Hey, how you doing? I'm Dwayne. How you got, you know, we're like, it's the friggin' rock. <laughs> and he go, how you guys doing? Where are you from? You wrestling today? And yeah. he genuinely would spend five or 10 minutes with you talking with you and say, well, good luck. Do your best. Amazing. Hope to see you guys here sometime. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's to guys that are just, yeah, yeah. We're just peons, you know? And so right there, we, I knew that this guy was something special. Mm. I heard something about Tom Cruise the other day. I know he's not involved in wrestling, but that he, um, he makes a point of when he goes into, whether it's an interview or goes into a, a, any room that he's working in or, or yeah, ha, has an interview, he, he goes around and meets everyone that's involved in the whole process and not just the presenter or the interviewer. He gets to know the whole crew that are working there. And by the time he leaves the place, he's remembered like everyone's name. He goes over, makes a point of saying, thank you for today. Goodbye says their name. And I mean, it's obviously like a master trick that he's, that he's, he's worked on, you know, over the years, but it, it seems or, or the, the general impression was that it, it had such a, a lasting effect on, on anyone that was in that particular room with him. And it, it just made people really like him that much more and want to work with him, um, which is, I think is pretty cool as well to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, it makes you be more human. And, and you know, um, I mean, even when I get a, if I get a guest starring role on a TV show, you know, I'm always, I'm not just there because sometimes the directors and your other actors, uh, I don't necessarily want to talk with you. They may be the leads of the show. They may be studying their lines. We got scenes coming up, but I'll go talk to the transpo guy. I'll go talk to the camera guys. Cause believe me, you become friends with those guys. You learn who's good to be one of the most important persons on the set to be friends with is the camera guy and the catering. Interesting. Because you want to eat and you also want to look good on camera. And if you're <laughs> friends with that guy, if you're friends with that camera guy, those operators, they'll make sure they get you in the good light and make sure they take care of you. But yeah, if you're friends with everybody, look, at you don't want to be known as that a-hole. If you're friends with the first AD, if you become friends with these folks and you, yes, sir, no, sir, and you get your stuff done. A lot of people that get on a set and start working right away, uh, they want to go mingle and do everything else. I will tell them, I tell the, the second AD or whatever, hey, look, I'm going to go get something to eat. Uh, otherwise I stick in my room. Yeah. If I can go BS and be out of the way and study stuff, if you make yourself not known, you know, if you don't be an idiot, you're not an a-hole, 
you can cruise around a little bit and watch stuff. I love to watch other actors work. I did a movie with John Malkovich. I got to watch, I kept my mouth shut and I snuck on over to when they were shooting scenes and I got to watch them because I kept my mouth shut and I stayed in the back. And it was so awesome to watch John Malkovich work. He's one of a, I mean, he's a quirky actor. But uh, yeah, so uh, when Tom Cruise is doing what The Rock does and going around and, and, and remembering people, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do because in the end, you want to work again. Yeah. In the end, you want people to know that you're a good dude. Yeah. Like I, I hear about Warren. I hear everybody does your show, they like you. <laughs> Did you actually hear that? <laughs> no, I don't. I'll start spreading the rumor now. Yeah, please. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, good. So um, rumor has it that you're a big fan of horror. And oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Can you talk to us about that? Why, why are you such a big fan of horror? And what's the sure. scariest character you've ever played? And what, how extreme has your makeup been on any particular occasion? I'm fascinated sure. by that. So uh, as a kid, I would, you know, I would sit down in front of the TV set and the Twilight Zone, Outer Limits. Um, I love that stuff. And as I got a little bit older, I got into all the Hammer more Hammer movies from the UK, you know, uh, Hammer Studios out there, the Christopher Lee's and all this Peter Cushing's and Vampire Circus, all this stuff that Hammer Films put out in the UK. And then, of course, all the you know, the, the Frankensteins, the creature oh, yeah. from the Black Lagoons. But I always knew as a kid that I wanted to be one of those monsters, you know. So one of the reasons, a Phantasm, which is a, one of my favorite movies, Halloween, you know, the original, which was one of my favorite movies growing up. I love to be scared. Yeah. And I said, I could do that. I could be that guy. And, and that's exactly you know, 100% why I got into acting as, a you know, tried to start being an actor at 21 because I loved horror movies and I wanted to be in a horror movie. Um, I didn't get into do any horror movies until I got into my thirties. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know, I got to be Leatherface uh, in the How remake for a week. And then I got hurt. I threw my back out, but oh, uh, no. I can still say I was Leatherface for yeah. a week, which is still cool. Um, I got to do a movie called the crazies with Timothy Oliphant. Um, that makeup and that was a kind of a remake of a, a George Romero a film who's passed away uh, you know Night of the Living Dead one of the still one of the greatest horror movies of all time made in 1967 by the zombie king George Romero then Dawn of the Dead so I got to do this remake with Timothy Oliphant the makeup would take about three hours to put on and about an hour to take off and still a couple weeks afterwards, you would always be like doing, oh, you would find stuff You'd be like, what? But um, that was awesome. Uh, getting to work with Timothy Oliphant was a, he's a very good, good actor, great guy, very humble. And um, got the cover of Fangoria magazine because of it. So as a kid, Fangoria magazine is a big deal for us horror, horror buffs and horror fans. So once I got that, I was like, oh, man, I'm on the co I remember the guy called me and said, hey, you're going to be on the cover of Fangoria. And I was like, I could I could die then. And I was like, well, I've, I've come full circle. Right. Yeah. I've, I've got to play. I got to play Leatherface. I'm now on the cover of Fangoria magazine. I've gotten to work with some pretty cool directors. I got to do a movie called John Dies at the End with Don Coscarelli, who Phantasm, Bubba Hotep. Beastmaster, a whole bunch of movies that I grew up watching. So, um, and now I'm friends with them, um, and it's it's pretty cool. It's um, there's so much stuff that you can do being an actor. You just gotta, you got if if especially doing horror movies. If some people don't like to get that makeup, they don't like to sit in that um in that chair and sit there and do two or three hours of makeup. A good friend of my wife and and mine, uh, Doug Jones. Um, He's on Star Trek now. Doug has played every monster there is out there, and he'll be in in uh, he'll be in makeup rooms sometimes for eight hours. Wow, eight hours just to get makeup. I mean, I, I don't know if I could do that, but uh, oh, that's, so uh, that's Derek Mears, who plays who's the played you know Jason, the new Jason, and a few other uh, few other classic horror movies and stuff. I mean. These guys, and you got to be in good shape for that too. I'm not in the greatest of shape, but these guys that do creature, we call it, you know, creature work, mm. um, 
they have to be in really good shape because to have that that suit on you're wearing or be able to sit there for three or four hours, five hours of makeup and then go act in hot weather. Uh, all the, uh, all the suits it's, heavy? it's not easy. Are they heavy? These particular suits that they have to wear? Sometimes they're heavy. Like mine wasn't so heavy, but we were filming in Austin for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And um, I didn't have a cool suit underneath me, which is something that keeps you cool. Like, uh, you know, Mike Myers, when he played Fat Bastard, Mike Myers, he had a cool suit underneath so he could stay cool. And I overheated it in mine and got heat stroke. And that, you know, took me from finishing the rest of the movie. But yeah, so not necessarily some of them are heavy, some of them are not. It's just a, a heat factor yeah. and a comfortability if you're comfortable in it. Yeah, yeah. And now you're filming for, you know, you may get that on, it takes five hours to put on, and then you got 10 hours of filming. So it's tough. And one of the other tough things is the the eyes. So the contacts, those things have to be, you know, you have to have some guy who gets paid like 50 bucks an hour to, which is great. I wish I had that job. You come around and drop eye drops in your eyes every five minutes. Serious. Just to make sure. 50 bucks an hour. Wow. That's amazing. Something like that. You know, it could be more. It's probably union. It's probably 150. But, you know, to wear these contacts, we call them Michael Jackson contacts. He's like in Thriller, he had these giant contacts. And the contacts have gotten better in the business nowadays, but uh, they're still giant okay. and your eye can dry out very quickly. So, yeah, yeah. But, but they're fun. I love, I love playing creatures. I, I mean, I, I, I would do it the rest of my life if given the opportunity. Nice. Good stuff. It's super interesting to hear about all this. Um, and, and one, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, your, the voice of bad boy mowers, I should say bad boy mowers. Yes. Um, that's a pretty huge show in the U S yeah. So it's a, it's a lawnmower company, right? Yeah. So we make lawnmowers, right? We make these zero turn lawnmowers. It's like you're sitting on a tank and you're steering it like this. Yeah. No steering wheel. So the two, um, what happened is, so 18 years ago, I went to a small, I made an appearance at a small little bike show in Batesville, Arkansas. And, um, I liked the town so much. I said, man, this is a beautiful town right on a river. People were genuinely nice. There was probably population 8,000 through the whole town and the out, outskirts of town. And I was like, I really like this place. This is beautiful. This would be a great place to retire. Where can you make money here? Yeah. Me as an actor, what, what could I do here? And the guy says, well, there's a lot of churches. And I said, well, I mean, I'm a, I am a godly man, but I don't think the church want me yet, right? I don't know how I'm going to do that. But there's a company called Bad Boy Mowers, which is brand new. And I'm like, Bad Boy Mowers. It's got a cool name. I'm already a spokesman for the bad boy on the West Coast, Jesse James, in our TV show, Monster Garage. So I got some emails for the two owners. And I emailed them for a couple of years. Anytime I was in a magazine, anytime I was on TV, anytime I did some cool interview, I said, hey, I, I want to work for you guys. I know you're going to start running commercials eventually. Let me be the voice of your company. Let me be the voice of your commercials. Finally, after two years, one of the owners says, all right, stop sending me crap. Stop sending me magazines. What do you, what do you want? And I said, I want to be the your, the voice of your, your company. Let me do the commercials. And I said, just give me a hundred grand. And he I think he hung up on me, to be honest with you. And then I called back and I said, look, at I, I, I'm whatever. You tell me what you want to pay me. I just, I would love to be able to branch out and do something cool like this. And yeah. I have been doing the voices for their commercials and, and their, you know, their, uh, company videos that we put out and for, for 18 years now. So 18 years, it's wow. been a blessing. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I just never thought I would be the, you know, people will sometimes call me going, I heard you on a, on a lawnmower commercial. And I go, that was me. That's it. That's me. That's what I do. So been very blessed yeah yeah but now real so between the monster garage and that that stuff i got on my own that stuff with no training yeah. so now trying to be a voiceover actor a hundred percent different it's totally different yes i i come with uh, some credits Man. folks we're in cajun country that's right bell rose 
Louisiana, and it's no problem. Because we're at No Problem Raceway. I got a couple thousand dollars to give away. Who's going after it? Ted Light. How you doing, Ted? Fine, sir. Lumberton, Texas. Downtown. Downtown. <laughs> Where is that in association with Tyler, Texas? Is that close? Uh, I'd say 150 miles. All right. You love motorcycles. Thanks for coming out. Boom. <laughs> But it's still, it's it's tough. It's not the same thing when you have all these people who make a living doing voices for commercials, for cartoons, for games, mm. and trying to break into this. I thought I would have an easier go of it because I, I come with a little bit of a resume. Man, not, it's, it's learning all over again and starting mm. at 53 year, years old, trying to learn this business. It's, it's a tough thing, but mm. I'm excited about the opportunities and I'm learning as we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you are you re record? Um, are studios open uh, in the U.S. at the moment, or or not? Is all recording being done from from home studios right now, or? Yeah. So ninety percent is. Uh, I would say ninety nine percent, up until a couple months ago, is you're recording at home. Yeah. You do the audition at home. They may, if you have, a proper setup, you may be able. If you book that gig, you could do it from your house. I happen to have a good friend here that I'm in his place right now that has a nice setup, has a booth. This is what he does for a living. So I can just drive. I drive a half hour, come over here. And um, if I have something booked or we're going to Zoom, I'll, or if I'm going to record something, I can come here. But yes, a lot of the studios are open. Voiceover studios are open for the booking. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you're doing everything from home. So you've, you've written a book? You're a published oh, yeah. Yeah. We should definitely talk about that. Um, Ken, and, and the title for your book. Uh, so this is, uh, <laughs> you've got the co-author is Bruce Collins. Yes, very talented it's, writer. Yeah, so you and Bruce Collins. And, and the, the, the book is called The Big Schwag's Positive Self-Help Guide for Complete Losers Like You. What a fantastic yeah. title. I love it. Um, what it, what's it about? What's it about, uh, Brett? Can so, you <laughs> yeah. So I used to have a, I had a radio show called wrestling 101, a pro wrestling show. Yeah. And we talked about wrestlers and, and, and Bruce was a guy that would come in and he would do, uh, and I had a thing called monster radio, another, a different show. And Bruce would come in and be like our book report guy. He'd be like, Oh, I read this book on farts or whatever it is. Some weird stuff. And he would, we'd let him do a book review on the show. And he said, you know, you could write a book. I'm like, I can't write a book. Bruce, who wants to read something from me? He said, you could do a self-help guide book. And I'm like, how are we going to, how am I going to, I can't even help myself. But we, we would go through chapter by chapter. And uh, after about eight months, we finally had a book written. And uh, it, it's really good. It's a tongue in cheek book. It's, uh, but it has a lot of, it's a good outlook on life, right? It's, okay. It's basically telling you, you know what you need to do to be a better person to get further on in life. You don't need, you don't need to send forty nine ninety five to uh, these folks out there. You know, four easy payments. You know exactly in your heart what to do, and we just talk about that how to do better things. But it's a little tongue in cheek, and it's how the big swag, uh, my alter ego, would uh, would would write something and talk about it. And um, we didn't know what to call it, so. Let's just call it the Big Swag Self-Help Guide for Complete Losers Like You. Now, Published America was the company that put it out. And unfortunately, they're no longer. So if you can find one of these copies, they're going for so much money on on okay. uh, eBay, like, you know, $800 or something. And oh my goodness. I think I have one copy. I remember when they came out, I bought a thousand. I spent thousands of dollars so I could give them out to folks. You know, so the company was so excited to hear that, you know, I'm giving them a check. I forget what it was for 3,500 bucks or something just to give people a book. Um, the biggest compliment I ever had about the book is a friend of mine, Mad Dog Mike Bell. He was a professional wrestler, uh, helped me get into the business. He, he had passed away, but his father read the book and said, uh, you know, this book should be at every AA meeting, NA meeting there is. It's because Mike was having problems with, with uh, 
alcohol and drugs and he had just gotten sober and it was crazy because he had gotten sober and he was doing well then he passed away but his father read the book and said this is such a good book it, it's such a fun read i like to call it it's a two it's a two crapper read you could go to the bathroom twice and you could finish the book in two two sittings oh. um but he gave me depends a compliment and said, this is a great book. For, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, well, it depends. Uh, us Yanks, were in there a long time. Um, and he read it and said it was great. And they, all these NAAA meetings should have this book. And that was a very good compliment. It is a good fun read if you can find it. If I can find an extra copy, I'll send you one. Oh, mate, that would be um, incredible. But uh, it was fun to do. Now, the problem with writing books is getting to publishing. If you go through a self-publisher, you make no money. Yeah. I was on TV at the time, you know, 10 times a week with Monster Garage and other stuff. And I thought because of that, we would sell this book and I would make a lot of money. And it's it's like anything else. It's like you have to work at it. And uh, I will I suggest not going through a self-publishing company. I suggest if you're going to write something, you get a good publisher and you wait until you get a legitimate publisher to do something. That's my only advice on books. Okay. Um, I, would you consider writing another book? Is it was it an enjoyable experience making the book? Because it's oh yeah, you want to do oh, again? yeah. We're I'm writing one about um, not so much self help, but uh, my you know twenty years being in the acting business and um, some of the celebrities and cool people I've come across. You know, bike builders, celebrities, uh, some of the cool experiences I've had, and some of the nuts so stuff that I've done, and so. It, well, I'm sure we'll ruffle some feathers, but uh, it'll make for a good movie. Yeah. You write the book, hopefully someone likes it, and they go, hey, that would be a good movie. Um, yeah, yeah. But Hollywood is a weird place. So if you can last long enough out here in the business or in the entertainment business, it doesn't matter whether it's in your, you know, the UK or you're in the States or you're somewhere else overseas, if you can last long enough, you're going to see a lot of things, mm. a lot of crazy things, a lot of weird things. And uh, if you just keep those, jot those, I would say this, you jot that stuff down. If you jot it down in a little book and you just keep jotting down these cool stuff, uh, eventually you're going to have enough stuff to go, wow, this would be a good book. And someone yeah. would find this interesting. So for sure. I was, yeah, in, sure. I was we got in Hollywood for like two weeks and uh, I saw so many fascinating things just during a two week spell. So I, I can imagine if you live in it all the time, it might, yeah, there must be so much, so much material out there. Incredible. Oh, Drew Barrymore stories. I mean, I got, I got so many good stuff. I mean, you know, so, and I also saw, so half of my, I'm 53 years old now. So I was working bars up until I was 30 from 16 years old to 30 years old. I was working the clubs and bars in Hollywood. So imagine all those young actors and older actors and, you know, the drunks, the drugs and all that stuff I came across. So if you can, if I can't, if I don't get sued, I mean, some of those people are dead, so I won't get sued hopefully by them. But some of the stuff I saw was crazy. I'd love and then to you mix this, in, by the way. It sounds amazing. Yeah. It, so it would be great. So yeah. I have some really good, fun Drew Barrymore stories and she's got her own talk show now. Yeah. Maybe I can maybe I can leverage it and say, look at I'll leave this out of that chapter if you bring me on your show. Give me some publicity. Yeah, yeah. Do you know Drew Barrymore? Are you on speaking terms or I don't think she'll remember me. I mean, I could bring up a couple circumstances she might remember, but uh she is one of those um she's an uh, one of the nice people in the business out here. You never hear anybody say anything bad about her and um she's a good person. So there you go. All right, a um, couple more things uh, before we wrap. Uh, uh, can you give me one, ideally not work-related, but a, a standout moment in your life, a monumental moment? It's something I'm asking all of my guests, but it, it could be, you know, that you've traveled to a particular place, you've uh, experimented with a particular type of food, you've climbed up a very tall mountain, I don't know, whatever it may be. Well, um, I mean, it is an acting deal, so my first real movie I ever did was a movie called Bicentennial Man with uh, Robin Williams. And yeah. I'm a delivery guy and I deliver Robin Williams uh, to the house as a robot. But I was up in San Francisco for two weeks, you know, for two days worth of filming. And I was so nervous because, you know, Robin Williams is 
you know, at the time was, a, he was still the hero of mine. I grew up watching him on Mork and Mindy. In fact, when I was a kid, I went to a, a, a private school and uh, Grant Johnson was this kid I was in school with. And his father was the producer of Mork and Mindy. So we had a sleepover. So I, I got to imagine I'm 10 or 11 years old, 12 years old, and three in the morning, uh, his dad comes home with Robin Williams and there's six kids, six young boys in the house. And here's Robin Williams. And, you know, and he was, a, I didn't realize at the time, but he was probably a little, a little tipsy, you know, and he entertained me and, uh, and these kids for like an hour till four or five in the morning. I was like, wow, that's Mork. Yeah. Mork from Mork and Mindy. So flash forward, you know, 20 years later, I'm in my first movie and here's Robin Williams and I have a scene with him and I was like, oh my gosh. Now, Robin Williams will start cracking jokes on the set and everybody listens. And then when the director says, okay, hold on, let's get in our places, he'll stop the joke. And then when they we do the scene, then when they say cut, and this was director Christopher Columbus, very wonderful director. Uh, Mrs. Doubtfire and a whole bunch of other stuff. Oh, yeah. And then Robin will finish the joke when they say cut. So it was the last day of shooting for me. You know, they were about to go, all right, hey, let's thank Brett. Thank you, Brett Wagner. And everybody claps, you're going home. And all of a sudden I decide I'm just going to go for it. And I start cutting a joke. Well, everybody's like all of a sudden turns and they're looking at me like, what are you doing, kid? And I cut this joke. And no, and no, one, no one's laughing. And Robin Williams says, hey, man, stick with your day job, kid. Leave the jokes up to me. And then everybody starts laughing. And he gives me a hug. And he says, it was very nice meeting you. And I told him that story afterwards about how you entertained me, you know, 20 years ago when I was a kid. And he's like, I was probably, I was probably, you know, two sheets to the wind. And I said, you were, but we didn't know that. And it was an honor to work with you. And That's thank you for cracking story, a joke yeah. on me. But so that was... Uh, that was a pretty big deal. Uh, <laughs> drag racing. You know, I do a little drag racing. I'm, I'm a very large guy at 6'5", 300 pounds. So I don't fit into cars very well, especially a dragster. Um, and I hosted a drag racing show called Pastime for six years on Speed Channel. The fastest game show in America ever. That's what I like to call it. But I never drag raced. And so people used to make fun of me. You host a show about drag <laughs> racing, yet you don't do it. So I went to school, Frank Hawley's Drag Racing School. If anybody comes out from the UK or in the United States that wants to go to a drag racing school, that's the one to go to. And I learned how to go to drag race. I had a friend in Canada that let me drag race his dragsters up in Canada. And I went 196 miles an hour in about seven, low seven seconds in the quarter mile. And I, for me, that was a big deal. You know, that was uh, something my dad used to take me to as a kid. We'd go to drag races and my father's no longer with me. But here I remember when I won 196 miles an hour and beat this guy in a race, I was, you know, crying in the car going, gosh, if my dad could only, you know, be here to watch this. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I know he was watching. But, you know, to go almost 200 miles an hour. And, and that's why I say you should do everything. Try something if you want to try something, go do it. Because as you get older, it gets a little tougher, you know, but do everything. And if you're in the entertainment business, do everything. If someone says, Hey, do you want to do a radio interview? You're like, well, I've never done a radio interview. Just go do it. Yeah. If someone says, do you want to co-host a podcast with me? Go do it. Because eventually if you throw 20 things up on the wall, maybe two of them will stick, but you always learn something. So my one advice at last scene in this business is try everything and you never know what's going to stick. Wow. You never know what you're going to be really good at. You never know what opportunities will happen. So like mm -hmm. me meeting you now, right? So now when I come out to where you live, I know I got a place to stay. Yeah. I know you're yeah. going to buy me the first 50 pints of beer. Yeah. I, I mean, I live in Sweden and alcohol is very expensive, but even so, yes, I will. <laughs> Are you in Sweden? Well, I mean, that's good. Sweet. I got relatives over there. So yeah, I have some you? Viking relatives over there. So we'll, 
Okay, nice. We'll go have a, we'll go have yeah. a nice tasty. I don't know what they drink over there, but well. oh, all sorts, all sorts. <laughs> I mean, everywhere's closed at the moment, but ordinarily people like to go out and drink and party a lot. Um, oh wow, yeah, that, I would love that. That would be that would be a, a lot of fun for sure. Uh, all right, we're going to end with the game. We're going to end with the game, Brett, and then I'll let you go because I know you're a oh, very busy. All right. man. Uh, a little bit of would you rather? Um, I'm going to ask you five questions, and then just spit out the first thing that comes to your mind, um, and and that'll be it. Are you ready? I'm ready. Cool. All right. Number one: Would you rather live by Hakuna Matata or YOLO as a motto? You know, I really hate that YOLO thing. I just don't like the name. I don't like how it comes rings off my tongue. How it comes off. So Akuma Matata. Yes. Okay. Good. All right, number two. Would you rather talk like Yoda or breathe like Darth Vader for the rest of your life? Nah, Darth Vader. Very good. Would you rather have a hundred duck-sized elephants or one elephant-sized duck? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Give me the hundred. I can market that. Give me the uh, hundred. I'll take the hundred. Cool. All right, number four. Uh, would you rather wear a clown wig or clown shoes every day? I go with the wig. Nice, I like it. I like to be out there. It's going to get more attention. Yeah, well, yeah. I think they both would, but yeah, probably, yeah. Let's go with that. I like it. All right, number five. Would you rather be a clown who distracts the bull or the cowboy who rides the bull? Well, now... <sighs> So I know some guys, and they're called uh, American Bullfighters. That's the clowns, right? Um, you say, well, they're not fighting bulls. Well, yeah, they are. Uh, those guys are tough. And there's some, and, and just as tough as the cowboys. I don't have the speed, but I would think I'd, I might want to be one of the clowns. if I Because if I could do that, that would mean I would have the agility. My legs would be good. <laughs> there's something... And you're saving the cowboys. That's what their job is there. They're saving the bull riders. So yeah. I, I want to be that paramedic, the paramedic clown that's saving the bull riders and sometimes looking death in the eye. I love it. Very good. 